on this computer. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, originally we were going to be live with Wiramu and Alistair, but it turned out that they weren't, they couldn't be in the same place at the same time. So we recorded them. And we think the most beautiful thing about the recording is the relationship between Wiramu and Alistair. And we want to invite you to watch for that. Because Alistair came to New Zealand as a Scottish psychiatrist who, who knew nothing about Maori and took a job at a Maori counseling center. And Wiramu was the Maori traditional healer at the counseling center. And, and through their uniqueness, they formed an amazing relationship. And we think it's an incredible model for um, how to work collaboratively. And of course, there's a lot more to hear from Wiramu and Alistair including their friendly banter about who's supposed to answer each question. So um, now when they, when they started, they asked us to have a prayer and a song to give that context to the work. So we'll start with the prayer, but we'll spare you the song. <laughs> well, and maybe someone out there has a Wabanaki song, a Penobscot Passamaquoddy song that they could share with us. And if not, maybe we'll sing a Lakota song. But Lakotas are colonizing the world, so we have to be a little careful here. So, um, so we're going to get started. I'm going to share a screen. Okay. And we'll have the chat on. All right. So I want to welcome Alistair and Wiramu to the gathering and I want to say to the spirits of this place and to invite the spirits of your place to join us in this magical electronic way. Spirits probably understand much better than we do. But I just I, just invite uh, good energy to come from this gathering, and I ask the spirits to, to make this sacred, to make it holy, to make our our meeting together a benefit to the people who will hear us later on, and a benefit to us and to the people whose lives we touch, <laughs> to the people whose lives are intermingled with our lives, and, and we ask. Um, Collective. Uh, Lewis, we've lost the vid. We've lost the sound. Enlivened and invigorated, and to have more to give than we thought we ever had. So I say thank you to all the spirits who gather the ancestors. Um, sky, the earth. Thank you so much for our lives, for this opportunity to gather, and um, for good friendship. I'll be sing. We're going to sing a song. So, um, do we have any Penobscot or Passamaquoddy singers who could sing us a song? How do we look at the, how do we, well, no, no, how do we, how do we look at the, to see if anybody raised their hand? Stevens, if she's here. Yeah. If you scroll down and see if it's on. No. See the arrow? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. That's the one. Lauren Stevens here? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Yeah. L. Stevens. L. Stevens. Is that you? Would you sing us a song? Sure. 
Is she there? Maybe not. Well, should we sing a song? We could sing a very short thank you song. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so we'll sing a really short thank you song. We thank all of you guys for being here and the spirits for coming. And the ancestors. And the ancestors. <laughs> All right. All right. So let us continue. Shared with. No, 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 no. We're going to go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Barbara knows how to do these things yes. really well. Yes, She's like an expert. Yeah. Okay. There we go. That's here. Okay. Was to speak first. <laughs> I would I would like Wadamu to speak first, so Wadamu, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> Here we go. Hi, Tina Rata. The Chata he can to me at Turaki Akwe, Lewis, Akuru Kobabra, Mahiti Karakia. Uh, um, first, I, I just like to acknowledge the beautiful words that you have given for this meeting and the beautiful, beautiful, we call it kinaki, the icing on the cake was the um, giving of the song to support your prayer. It was beautiful. And I think I heard it before the last time. We, we, we met in Australia somewhere. But um, kia ora koutou, Alistair, tēnā koe, good morning. Um, who am I? Actually, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm from the mountains of New Zealand, as you can see by the way, um, my, my, uh, the way I'm, I am. Um, um, I like to think that the work that I do is enhanced by the people that I, I know, like including um, the great writer of our book. Um, and people like you guys, Lewis, you know, that, that, that just gives us uh, more, more um, encouragement to do the work and what we do, and we do it well. Um, of course, I give I give all acknowledgement to our Creator, um, who created the heavens and the earth, and all the people thereof. In. And going back to the fact that we're spiritual beings experiencing the human existence, so we all related by spirit, according to what I think. So that's who I am. What am I I am from Gisborne, New Zealand, and I am a I don't know what I am. I'd have to let Alistair describe that. Because the Kumara doesn't speak of its own sweetness. <sighs> Not that I'm sweet. But anyway, <laughs> that's me. Your turn, Alistair. Um, inga mana, inga reo, inga hauefa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, Māori ora ki a koutou katoa. So, um, I want to join with Wadamu in greeting everyone on this um, course. Um, greeting you, Barbara, and you, Lewis. Um, I want to thank you, Lewis, for a very beautiful uh, prayer, which I think set the scene wonderfully for this kōrero, or this uh, 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 chance to share some stories and to talk together about the different types of work that we do. So, um, 
my name's Alistair, Alistair Bush. I uh, am a Pākehā New Zealander, that means a European New Zealander. I have had the privilege of working um, with Wiramu in different ways uh, over the last 15 years. And my job is that I'm employed as a doctor, as a, a, a psychiatrist working with children and, and teenagers in an Indigenous Māori mental health service in Porirua, which is near Wellington, New Zealand. Now, it's possible that uh, some of our listeners may be a bit unclear about where New Zealand is. And if that's the case, I can say that uh, New Zealand is a, uh, a nation in the South Pacific. We have two main islands and we have um, our indigenous people are Māori and the uh, significant populations of Māori uh, in the North Island of New Zealand. Uh, and Wiramu um, uh, comes, as he was saying, from uh, three particular tribal areas in the North Island. And uh, we just had the, uh, well, I had the good fortune of meeting Wiramu when I, within a month of starting at uh, Te Pari Marie, which is the Māori service I work for. And so I'm wondering, is that enough by way of introduction, um, Lewis? Um, yeah. Well, we'll throw in a few tidbits here and there, since since you'll you'll never sing your own praises as as well as we can. So, um, yeah. Why don't we Why don't we launch into what we're going to talk about? And um, so, well. So many things in your book spoke to me. I thought maybe we could begin talking about Maori, Mana, and Tapu, because I thought uh, those seemed like really important concepts. And of course, you feel free to talk about anything you want to, because that's, you know, that's the way it is. Whatever spirit whispers in your inner ear, you should say. Uh, regardless of what I ask, but but maybe that could launch us, get us started. with would be the concepts from, from the Maori people? So I'm wondering, what am How we should best uh, do this? Some something that we've sometimes done is that I'm I'm happy to tell a story about how I first came across these concepts and working with Wiramu, and then maybe Wiramu could describe some more detail about the concepts. That yes. could be one way. Mm -hmm. Does that sound all right with you, Wiramu? I actually think you should do it all, but I'll go with whatever <laughs> you <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, um, and by the way, Lewis, feel free to steer us in a different direction if you would like to, if you'd like to. But um, the, Sometimes Wurumu and I, when we're uh, speaking together, we end up having a bit of a tussle about who should be speaking because I think he should be doing the speaking and he's often inviting me to do the speaking. But anyway, um, so uh, Wurumu and I both started working at our Māori service in about 2005, within about a month of each other. And I got to know Wurumu fairly early on he helped me uh, learn a karakia or a prayer in the Māori language. He helped me with to figure out the best way of greeting Māori families. Um, and he was very kind. But when it came to understanding the kind of work that he was doing in our service, he, he was employed as a cultural therapist. But I had very little idea what that meant. And even though we were in team meetings together every week, um, over the first two or three years that we were working together, I would say that I had no idea what what he was doing in his work, what his work as a cultural therapist meant. And um, it was only when I noticed several families where we were having considerable difficulties engaging with the family, even though we were a Māori service, um, even though we had Māori practitioners, apart from myself, obviously, 
uh, working in the teams, these families were uh, not wanting to meet with us. They were rejecting our assistance. And so what I noticed was that one of our nurses then um, uh, took Whittemu along to meet with the family, and suddenly there was a total shift in attitude from the family, and they were very happy to have us involved. And I was puzzled about what had happened in these situations. And so I would go and ask Whittemu, can you explain what happened? And he would say, well, nothing, nothing really happened. Um, I don't really know what, what you're referring to. Um, and so I got more curious, of course. And eventually I um, said to Whittemu, well, I would really like to understand more about your work and how you, how you work. Um, and I asked them if it would be okay for us to work together with some young people so I could actually sit in the room and see what Wittemu was doing. Now, it took me some years to realise that Wittemu was working as a Māori healer uh, because he never called himself that. And there's a, work, there's a word in New Zealand for a, Ma, for a Māori expert or healer, which is tohonga, and Wittemu never called himself that. And it was years later that some of my colleagues said, well, of course that's what he is. Um, but I would just like to describe one situation of a young person who uh, came to our service, and it illustrates the concepts of Modi, mana and tapu that you raised, um, Lewis. And so this was a young person who was about 17 at the time. He was still at um, high school or what we call college. And he, uh, one day he was running a bit late for school and he came out of the door of his house. And as he came to his front gate, he saw a very frightening image um, above the letterbox of what he thought was a Māori man yelling at him and he was learning the Māori language at school and he knew that he was yelling him in the, at, at him in the Māori language. And he um, panicked and ran back inside and um, the next time when he realised he was late to school and he was going to have to run out, go and get the bus, um, this would have been like 10 or 15 minutes later, he had another go, walked out, and the same man was standing by the letterbox shouting at him. And he um, was so frightened by this, he did eventually manage to run past his letterbox and make it to school, but he was um, terrified and began to have panic attacks and um, was very anxious. And so his... Um, Māori teacher at school, the Māori language teacher, figured out that something was wrong and asked him what was happening. And she, she considered that there was a Māori cultural problem going on and she organised for a Māori healer to visit the school and um, provide karakia, uh, which is a prayer, and the Māori healer threw some uh, blessed water on him and the visions disappeared. Now, um, when this young person was referred to our service because he was still having a panic problem, he met with Wittemu, and it was subsequently that I had a chance to ask Wittemu about the situation, and I was, I was puzzled to understand how to make sense of this, because my training is in uh, medicine and psychiatry, and, and I guess in the Western methods, which of course you would understand, Lewis, from your background in psychiatry as well. And there was no uh, cultural uh, landmarks for me to help me understand the situation. And when I, when I talked to Wittemu, he said, well, if you want to understand the situation, it would be useful for you to understand the concept of Modi. Um, so Modi, he said, is uh, and Wittemu will explain this in more detail in a moment, but he said Modi is like life force. But a person can have life force, but also an object could potentially have life force. So, for example, if a person is uh, 
holding something close, like for example, this is a piece of ponamu or uh, greenstone, but the Māori word is ponamu, and I wear it close to my chest. And Wiramu would say that over time, this this object will pick up the my uh, my modi, my life force. And um, so Wiramu said, if you understand this, then you'll understand why. My first question for this young person was, um, you know, when I found out what was going on, when I found out he'd been seeing this uh, warrior male uh, Māori character um, shouting at him, my first question to him was, um, what did you do? And on during that inquiry, the young person revealed that a a couple of weeks before the warrior first started appearing in his life, he had picked up a piece of greenstone or ponamu off the road. And it was a beautifully carved piece of greenstone and he put it around his neck. And so Wiramu said, that's the answer to this puzzle. Um, and so, of course, from my point of view as a psychiatrist, it's very hard to make sense of that. I've got no idea why a um, picking up a piece of ponamu could lead to someone having uh, visions of a Māori man shouting at them. But Wiramu said it's to do with understanding Modi. Um, so if that ponamu has the Modi or the life force of, a, of somebody's ancestor on it, then um, the and the, the, the ponamu belongs to that person, and then they've lost it and, it, and it and it was on the road, and then someone else picks it up. Then um, the Modi on the greenstone, well, um, which is connected to the person who owns it, to their ancestors, will be. Uh, uh, I guess the ancestors could be upset that this person has just picked up their ponamu. And as a result, the, um, uh, the person's ancestor may well have appeared to that young person and told them off. And so um, that's an, I guess that's an example that illustrates the expression Modi that you were asking about. The other thing is that by Picking, so if we're understanding tapu as something sacred or forbidden, there is a tapu about that ponamu. The young person picks it up and they have breached that tapu. And so the ancestor is, is concerned about that. I'm wondering if I could um, hand over to Wittemu now to explain more about what you understood was in relation to that young person, Wittemu, and further explanation of those concepts. Oh, that was very, very nice, Alistair. You could have just done it all yourself. Um, the thing about Modi being a life force, it's described as life force in the dictionary or translated. The thing with Modi, if you pull the word apart, it means ma, uri. The word ma means by, and uri means by connection or by relationship. So when I talk about life force, I would say that Māori, which gives me a connection to the divine, uh, to our creator, that's my connection to the creator. And when I say my connection to my mountains, my connection to my rivers, which gives me sustenance, my connection to my uh, the meeting houses, to the, um, the places where we live, and my connection to my family, and then my, my, my relations, and then to our tribe. That is the Modi. That's where my life force comes from. So if, if I have that ownership or that connection, it's like somebody taking off sweaty shoes and me putting my feet straight into those shoes. The residue from, from that person having sweated in those shoes it's still, it's still there. So when you're wearing something like this, 
close to your skin for so long and then somebody else picks it up, you're picking up that residue or how this this object or tonga has laid against my skin. And so you're actually taking on board my part of me. And so in our, in our culture, the, the ancestors, my long line of ancestors, go back to the beginning. So this represents my ancestors as well. And that's what happened to this young man. Is that enough? <coughs> And would you be able to explain the relevance of tapu in that situation and also the mana that relates to that? Thank you. Okay. Now, the tapu is that if I have a divine connection to the Creator, then I have, you know, I have, I have a, a, a sacredness by my divine connection to the creator and in that connection I also have an authority given by my divine connection so it follows that I am connected because of my Modi that's my connection I am sacred because of that connection and I also have authority to that connection I have authority by that connection which means that I am a sacred being and nobody can come into my space unless I give you permission. And the mana is, I have the authority to, to be selective about what I allow into my space. I don't have to accept. I have the authority to rise above sickness, my circumstances. And so that is my life force, my connection to the divine spirit. Okay. So, Lewis, is it okay if I um, just add a little bit in, in order to then ask Wittemu a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, this young person met with Wittemu, and he was still, even though the visions had stopped because of the karakia from the Māori healer in the school, this young person was still panicking because he didn't understand what was going on. And so Wittemu set about explaining to him the nature of the situation and helping him understand his circumstances and why this cultural problem had cropped up in order that the young person might understand it. And with that awareness, then he could um, uh, feel less anxious because he understood it. And he could know in the future how to manage those kind of situations. Um, and so Wittemu explained to him about Modi and about tapu and the importance of not breaching something tapu which might be sacred or forbidden. Um, and he explained to him some, some ways of looking after himself spiritually to manage those kind of things in the future. So um, I guess what I, one of the things I noticed in starting to work with Wittemu was the way he took so much care to explain things to family and he also said, you know, if you understand these concepts of, you know, Modi, Mana and Tapu, then you can make sense of a number of things which might seem very strange and mysterious otherwise. Um, and so in order to illustrate the concept of Mana a little bit, a little bit more, um, there have been a number of young people that we've met with over the years where they were suffering from something that looked like quite a strange, maybe psychiatric sort of problem. So for example, there was a young, uh, a 17 year old guy called George, who uh, started to have strange seizure-like episodes where it looked like he was having some kind of seizure, but it wasn't epilepsy and he was still awake. And at the same time, he started to hear uh, a voice telling him he was a bad person that um, he might as well kill himself, things like that. And of course, a lot of psychiatrists in that kind of situation 
would be concerned that there might be a psychotic illness and that this might be a reason to prescribe psychiatric medication. But this young person, when, when Wittemu and I, when I had an opportunity to offer for this young person to meet with Wittemu and the family were very keen to, Wittemu identified that there was a negative spiritual entity that appeared to be impinging on George and causing him to experience these symptoms. And so the interesting thing about that situation was that Wittemu spent quite a bit of time explaining to George about how he could strengthen his own mana, so how he could strengthen his own spiritual authority so that he would be able to reject this entity without necessarily relying on Wittemu for that. And so he explained to him about, um, in particular, mana, but also the other concepts. And so the idea was, if this young person could get really clear that he was in charge of his own space, that he would be in a position to tell this entity to get lost, to get out of his space. And the, the process of that, alongside Wittemu's support and the karaki or prayer, enabled him to heal himself. And so one of the things that I've noticed about Wittemu's work is that he will support families to find their own healing. Um, which is a kind of a different process from the usual psychiatric one that I'm familiar with, uh, and we, which many people will be familiar with, certainly you are, Lewis, where you know the psychiatrist is the expert and we prescribe a pill and that's supposed to fix a problem, right. although often seems like it doesn't. So um, I'm wondering, Wittemu, if you would be able to just say, make some comments about um, your experience of of working with George and the how that relates to the concept of mana. You're making it very difficult now, but yes, I'll try. Um, I, I think one of the first things is that the thing about mana is having that authority. Um, it, it also means that you should be respectful, um, you should value people, objects, land, whatever it is in front of you, you should value them. And so what I like to try and teach these young people is that, or teach anybody, well, tell anybody, is that anybody who comes into our space, we should respect them. We should give them that um, or acknowledge that they come from a long line of other chiefs and so it doesn't matter where they've come from at the time of the session or what has happened to them we should always give them that respect um, and that way I ensure that I uphold my own mana which is my honor um, my authority and by doing that I'm, I'm bestowing upon them uh, the honor that, that I carry so in that way, it honours them as well. But the thing is that when I look for anything, first and foremost, I look to the spiritual part because a lot of times that these young people, when they when I talk about them carrying their ancestors, they carry the ancestors with them, is that there's that saying that the cry of a woman in giving birth pierces the spiritual realm, which means that it opens up the heavens and brings safety to, to that particular birthing process. And so we see that the first thing that happens is that for a woman is from that cry of pain, then comes the second part, which is the flowing of that water, which is called a paha, which is called tara, which means pathway flows out and it says that for out of the belly shall flow rivers of living water. It means the, the rivers are the, is the genealogy of the line of ancestors that have come and the living water is the spirit. So from each generation, from 
I, your mother, her mother, her mother, her mother, her mother has given water. The water has had to flow from the belly in order that it might give life. So we're actually in a stream of life that flows down. Anything that is polluted or gets contaminated above us in the generations flows down and affects the generations below. Now, so I tend to look at the spiritual side of anything first. And then knowing that this young fella has picked up this and put it against his skin, he has now taken on the generations of the person who it belonged to. And he was carrying those people around with him, and they did not belong to him. So what I had to explain to him is that it was like choosing that for every, for every action we do, there is a consequence. So if we pick something up that does not belong to us, there is a consequence for that. Um, and that's what I said to him, that if you pick this up, there's got to be a consequence for that. So the end result is that we got rid of that, that we just put it back back to the land and um, or back to wherever he was going to be got it from and he came right and that's that's i hope that's what you wanted me to do um alistair that was lovely and i'm wondering if you can also comment on george who was a different young person and who was affected by the sort of seizure like episodes and the voice and explain um, what you experienced when we met with George and what the solution to that was? What about you're on mute? Thank you. Then I, I had the first part wrong, so now I can correct it. Can you hear me now? Good. This, um, this young man, uh, I noticed when he, when he came in, I noticed there was a female entity that, that actually was, was with him. And if you remember, I asked his mother, was there some, some, um, some crosswords they've had with somebody in the, uh, in their family, particularly a female. And she said, oh, yes, I remember she had an argument with her auntie. So what happens is they talk about unresolved generational stuff. The sins of the forefathers they talk about are things that haven't been resolved in the generations above affect the generations below. So in this particular case, this was the same generation but what happened is that his mum had had an argument with the auntie with her auntie and it had not been resolved as yet and it had come down and affected george so all that needed doing was for her to go back to reconcile apologize and let the auntie because the auntie was the oldest one in the line so it was to go and pacify the auntie who who unintentionally put these things on her on her niece or nephew, grand nephew. So she had no idea that she had done that. It was unintentional. But it was a fact that the an argument had caused that that the sins of the forefathers, or four mothers or four aunties in this case, would visit upon the generations below. And I think I'm confusing you, but that's what I reckon anyway. And thank you, Willamu. And, and would you mind just explaining what was the importance of mana in relation to George and him getting back to well-being? Okay. What I explained to George was that by our divine connections, we, have, we are sacred beings who have been given authority not to accept our circumstances, not to accept illness, and certainly to have the authority 
to ask these um, negative energies to get out of our space. So I just had to talk to him about his mana, that authority, and really instill in him the fact that he was a rangatira or a chief that came from a chiefly line. So he carried the generations of that with him as well, as well as the connection to the divine creator. And he got it. He got it. And so they were able to, once the mum had gone and dealt with the auntie to say or apologize, that entity had to leave. Came back a couple of times, I think, according to some of the portal, but he managed to to actually um, use his authority to get rid of it. Is that enough? Yeah, that's wonderful. And so we've um, been in touch with George seven years later, and he has continued to do really well. And that's as a result of Wittemu's intervention. And he'd actually been on some antipsychotic medication as well. And he just stopped that after seeing Wittemu. And it's one, he stopped the antipsychotic medication, but things got considerably better after that. Um, and I'm, I'm confident it was Wittemu's intervention. And so is he, and so is his mum confident about that. Um, so, Lewis, that's just that's a bit of a starting point in relation to um, uh, responding to your question about Modi, Tapu and Mana. Um, I'm wondering where would you like us to take this conversation now? I thought we would start for a moment. <clears throat> To have a bit of discussion um, because it seems to me that you know one of the things that we're wanting to talk about is um, opiate use disorder and it seems like this concept of, of mana of, of developing and cultivating and having and feeling the personal power to refuse entry to bad spirits is, is crucial to the recovery process. Now, that if the spirits of these drugs are, are coming into us, I mean, perhaps because we've invited them, we've opened the door, or the door was opened from trauma. This is one thing we didn't talk about, um, but we'll get to it a little bit later in the, in the video. Um, but, but they were talking about, they'll be talking about how when you take drugs to you open the door to the spirits, good spirits and bad spirits indiscriminately. And I think trauma does the same thing. Trauma opens that door and, and trauma attracts bad spirits or, or unfriendly spirits and, and it messes with people. And so this notion of cultivating mana, you know, of connecting with one's mara, or life force, and building your mana, and, and feeling that you are tapu, that you are sacred, is, is, a, is like an incredible um, antidote, you know, to this um, addiction, to the addiction syndrome. So, um, you know, that was sort of, that was what it inspired me, you know, to think about um, so I thought, um, if anyone else wants to say something about that, um, just, just type something in the chat line and I'll unmute you because it's, it's, there's enough people that it's incredibly hard to see the hands go up. <laughs> so anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, you're also talking about the center of the medicine wheel. Yeah, I mean, the scent, because this, well, and, and now I only know, I mostly know Lakota. So the center would be the place from which I connect to, all, to everything else. You know, that, that place of the interconnectedness of everything. And, and it is from that place that I'm in the center. 
of my universe, which, and, and if we're all in the center of our universe, then, then our connections are in balance and harmony, but they're not imbalanced. Um, oh, somebody wanted to, to say, turn off the screen share while we talk. Yeah, we can do that. Um, let me figure out how to do that. So much to learn. There we go. Yeah. Um, so it's more relational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More relational. Right. And I, I think that's really what Wiramu is saying with this Mara concept um, is that it's by Ma or an Ira relationship. So it's, it's um, connectedness, which, is, which seems to me really powerful. So it's, co it's connectedness to ancestors as well, isn't it? Because that's also where Mana comes from. Yeah, connectedness to ancestors, creation, nature, everything. It's kind of yeah. the life force. The life force, mm. that's what he called it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Steve writes, he says, I mean, ma Maori. Maori. Maori, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and Wiramu says it fast, so it sounds like Maori. But, um, yeah. The authority to ask a person to go or leave in the room. I see another indigenous example of having good and or respectful relationships with visiting spirits or entities. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And 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 I think that um, Magali was saying that the Western culture struggles with how to connect with center, which is not self-centering. And I think that the, the notion of center as we allows us to be in balance and harmony, you know, as opposed to I. Mm. And, and I think Wiramu spoke to that a bit. Yeah. All right. Shall we go ahead with, with a little bit more? It gets, it keeps getting better and better. So I will. Hello? Am I close? Which has been joined, remain intact. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, but let's talk a little bit about that active process of, of cooperation, reconciliation, collaboration, connection. Seems like, like so important. So, what about How about you explain Tatai Kono, and then maybe I can explain a bit about our uh, working together. Tatai Kono is a term used. We use it when somebody departs the earth. Apechi Kono Tatai Kono is just giving credence to the fact that once somebody has departed. They have gone to be with the spirits. So we talk about let the living remain with the living and let the dead depart back to the spiritual realm. That's what Tatai Hona means. It means um, let that which has been bound remain bound or re that which we bind, let it remain bound. And it talks about that, that the living will go on living and the dead be with the spirits. Um, and so it is the same in terms of reconciliation. There is another Māori saying that uh, 
te 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 tauna mai tai kau motu te 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 whānau e kore e motu. It means that the, even a steel chain can break through metal fatigue. But the bonds of a family, the bonds can never be broken, which means you can have um, arguments and you can be estranged from one another for years. But the bond of that blood and, and the family can never be broken. So it's the same with Tatai Hono. It means that that bond, let it remain, let it remain. Um, Never let it be broken. And basically, that's what that means. Um, yes, I think, I think, unless you want some more else, Would you mind saying something about why you thought that was an appropriate way of talking about our collaboration and this way of collaborating? really are making it difficult for me now. Um, I, I think that if we looked at everything in the sense of, it's like you and I have a type of a bond. We've worked together long enough for me to absolutely trust that you could have done this. Mind you, I'm glad I've seen Lewis and Barbara again and Dakota, but it's that thing of trusting. It's that it's about building a bond. It means the word hono means to to join or to bond. Tatai hono means cemented. Um, it just gives it that extra, like adding concrete in with uh, metal or something. But but I I think that it's like everything like. If you really have a passion for something, then that's a type of tatai hono. Because you're not going to let it go, you're not going to let it go past you, you're going to pursue it, because you have that full passion to do that, the tatai hono to hold, hold and fast, regardless of whatever cost it is to you, or um, how difficult it is at times, how many obstacles you have to cross to get there, but that gives it that, let that which is bound remain. Fair enough. Thank you, Wadamu, that's lovely. And the, um, I guess part of, part of your question, Lewis, is about this uh, idea of working together where we're coming from totally different paradigms. So my training in medicine and psychiatry um, uh, means that I'm coming from a so-called scientific way of thinking that um, if you, you know, the, the, the greatest truth is from looking down a microscope and making things smaller and thinking that we know what chemical we're dealing with. Um, whereas Wittemu's coming from a totally different paradigm where his, his paradigm is uh, that spirituality is fundamental to everything, uh, whereas in my paradigm in psychiatry, that usually doesn't get a look in. Um, and, uh, of course, these are things that um, our listeners will be understanding from an Indigenous point of view, that, that generally Indigenous knowledge has been put down or sidelined or silenced by Western ways of thinking. And so there are significant challenges in Wittemu and I working together. If I am a psychiatrist and you know, a medical practitioner, and Wittemu is a Māori healer, and you know, in New Zealand, similar to the US and Canada and other places, there have been many ways in which Indigenous knowledge has been silenced and um, sidelined you know, over the last centuries. For example, over 100 years ago in New Zealand, there was a law in the country making it illegal to practice Māori healing. And that came about in certain circumstances, but one of the results was that um, uh, 
Māori healers had to go underground in New Zealand, and so it appeared that Māori healing disappeared from sight. Now, those laws were repealed in the 1960s, but as, as our listeners will know, there is a very long history of colonisation, whether that be in the United States or Canada or Australia or New Zealand or many other places that were colonised by, uh, you know, particularly by European countries. And that colonising colonization process is there in the therapy room every time we meet with an Indigenous person. And that history is there. And it's, of course, different if you're an Indigenous practitioner. Your relationship with, uh, will be different. So if Wadamu and I are working together, it's, it's not just a matter of being two nice guys working together who get on well, but we have to know that our histories, our history of the relationship between our cultures is there in the room with us. And so part of what Wadamu is saying is that in order to deal with the, this difficult history, we can't, I can't be paralysed by it as a European, white European psychiatrist, by the fact that my culture has, um, uh, there have been so many injustices that my culture has contributed to, I can't be paralysed by that, but I have to be mindful of that. And so it would be very, you know, and what am I inviting me to, to do more of the talking, well, that's problematic as well. It would, I imagine you would much rather see and hear from Wurumu, and he keeps saying that I'm causing difficulty for him by inviting him to talk. I know that's what people want to do. They want to hear Wurumu, not me. So part of the, the I find this metaphor, Tātai Hono, beautiful because there's so much depth to it. This, the relationship that Wurumu and I have and that you as an Indigenous practitioner might have with your um, senior um, Indigenous person or with other colleagues, the, these, um, there needs to be a particular strength in that relationship to withstand the history, for example, between my people and Wadamu's peoples, um, to, for us to find a way through so that we can work together for the, in the best interests of young people that we're working with, with families, with all of our, our clients, if you like. So, um, so I guess that's another aspect of, the, of what Tātai Horn is referring to, is there's a whole history to this partnership that's important to understand. And, um, and you know, we, Wadamu and I have had, we've had disagreements or we've had misunderstandings or Wadamu has been hugely patient with me when I ask him a hundred questions to try and understand from my Western Pākehā point of view, a concept which is deeply spiritual and significant and which I'm very ignorant about. Wadamu has been so patient, he'll, he'll listen to the questions, he'll keep explaining. Um, and that, I guess, that forbearance has been such an important gift for me in terms of my learning and helping me understand a little bit more about where he's coming from and and how can we help young people um, from both the points of view so that they can benefit from some knowledge that psychiatry or psychology or counselling might give them, that they can also benefit from Māori healing knowledge um, and the concepts that come from that. Now, so I'm sure that's enough from me. <laughs> I think it's really interesting because the name of this course is Two-Eyed Counselling. And um, we're, we're endeavouring to cultivate what you and Wiramu have uh, and to, to present the idea that uh, different and equal, uh, one does not dominate the other. And probably, probably somewhere along the line you got dropped on your head I don't know many psychiatrists who could be as respectful as you were to what Wiramu was doing. Uh, most of my colleagues wouldn't even notice that um, he met with and they improved. Uh, so what? So what happened to you? Did your mother drop you on your head, or you know, get kicked by a cow? What happened to you? 
Um, I'm not sure, but I, I certainly felt that in the in my early years working in our Māori service, that there were some families that we were having great difficulty with, um, that, you know, difficulty from the point of view of how do we engage with these um, families? How do we, you know, they, they've got needs, they're, they're dealing with considerable adversity, um, you know, there's, there's issues of poverty and maybe some family violence and, and plenty of other things. And somehow, somehow the connection wasn't happening. And so it was pretty dramatic to me seeing these situations where things would turn around. And I guess the other thing is I've, over the years, I've been interested in spirituality, but felt that I didn't know how to translate this into clinical work, really. And what was beautiful about sitting down with Whitamu was he was able to give me beautiful explanations and he was able to teach me concepts that would open up kind of like a whole vista, a whole door to a different way of thinking about someone's distress. Um, so I think probably I don't like, want to liken my relationship to Whitamu with being kicked by a cow, but um, um, I do think that the relationship has, you know, because we get on really well, and um, and because he was prepared to give me the time of day, he was prepared to try and respond to these very difficult questions because they were coming from a, a, a totally different paradigm. He he would give me, he would explain to me, you know, this young person with the piece of ponamu that he picked up off the road, he said to me, this is like a spiritual gym. Um, so what he was doing was he was using a medical metaphor to help a doctor understand a spiritual Māori problem. And so what fantastic teaching. And so I think even, and I, he was prepared to persist. You know, 10 years after I'd started asking him ignorant questions, he was still prepared to sit down and um, give me the time of day and try and answer the question, even though it was it was the 10th time that I hadn't got it. Um, he was still prepared to... Um, so, you know, Whitamu had so much forbearance. I think that's probably... Um, that's probably a different kind of being kicked by a cow. He, he Notice that you have all the ancestors. <laughs> he's never made any comments about my ancestors, but maybe he's been restrained. <laughs> Here's your chance, Wiramu, to make some comments about his ancestors. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm too in awe by the way they wear those little skirt things. What do you call them? Um, Kisses. Kilts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, because because we wear them too, you know. And I thought straight away we've got to be related. So, two guys in dresses have yes. to be related. Yes. Yeah. So we can stop for a minute. <clears throat> and um, I just. Um, I really appreciate the quality of their relationship. And I, I think it's really worthy of, of commenting upon because it's what allows two-eyed seeing and two-eyed counseling to happen, is that incredible respect that they each show each other in, in you know, clearly in different ways. Um, and so, um, I don't know, I, would anyone like to comment on that um, or, or anything else before we go on and, and watch the last part of the, the video? Uh, this is Margie from Alaska, Kodiak, and I guess it's, it's very validating and reassuring to me. When I work with people here in Kodiak, I always feel like the imposter and it makes me feel better about the fact that I have a role and a place in these kinds of discussions and in this work. 
So thank you. Yeah, I I think I think it's important that um, one not discount the position that you take or that Alistair takes um, because it's it may I, I mean I, I think it's part of healing historical trauma really is is to be truly collaborative is a way of 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 restore restoration, you know, of, of, of recovery. So, yeah. Um, the chat's great. Yeah, the chat's great. <clears throat> and the, the thing, you know, um, Alistair reminds me of this TV character, Columbo. You know who who was one of my favorites from a long time ago, and Columbo was a detective who solved cases by being puzzled and playing dumb and asking questions, and and it's not a bad approach sometimes, you know, to get people to explain you how things work. You're talking about the curiosity, yeah, that, the curiosity. that Alistair has, so. right? in 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 uh, really wanting to know and really uh, respectfully understanding yeah mm. yeah that and and noticing just noticing you know i mean that's huge right there mm. yeah all right shall we why don't we continue let's see i have to share a screen can i add something yes, yes. I'm not sure if you can see my hand up. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Uh, I thought it was uh, pretty powerful from one healer to another. Uh, to And not surprising to me to have that uh, respect and uh, to have that, uh, um, as we say, uh, tapahono, that cement, that trust from one healer to another. I think what's interesting, and I'm curious also, is that if two healers can share that respect towards one another, how also important it must be for that individual healer to develop that same trust with an individual or a patient, not necessarily a healer, but like someone like Dennis, to validate Dennis's situation, to respect Dennis's worldview. And, um, uh, it would be interesting to see and observe Alistair's approach to with working with Dennis and and also to see uh, the approach from New Zealand uh, from a, a Maori healer and um, and and see how that uh, respect and validation would take hold between a healer and a individual that's troubled with trauma or troubled through drugs. It'd be interesting, I think, if we could see the same, same uh, validation and respect for one's worldview as we see between these two healers. Yeah. One of the um, ideas that Eduardo Duran talks about as well, that, that Wiramu um, is referring to, and, and Alistair referring to, um, Eduardo Duran called it liberation psychology and and you know liberation theology was a was a Jesuit um, you know Christian idea for people serving in Latin America talking about not talking down to people and not kind of of, of assuming an authority but participating in the issues and, and, the, and the culture and that's that was the um, philosophical impulse for the clergy in Latin America to participate in, in um, ideas of liberation at the time in the, in the, in the, in the 80s and 90s. And, and um, Eduardo Duran talks elsewhere in, in Healing the Soul Wound about liberation psychology, talking about, and it's the same idea that when you're from the you know, so-called dominant culture, and and you're um, you're trying to create relationship and trying to use two-eyed seeing principles 
that you you have to own your place in the in the trauma you have to own the part the way that you participate and it it's quite a careful boundary to own that and at the same time not get immersed in it and become you know the the uh the apologist but to recognize the force for what it is so it adds this other dimension to the work and i think that's where um, you know, respect for the client, respect for the trauma that someone's experienced is, is really important. And to make sure that you're not um, visiting a kind of colonized vision of success on the person who you're, who's bringing the trauma forward, that you're not trying to say, well, you need to do these things because, you know, our biases run deep, including it, to what wellness looks like and to what healing looks like and what to what can be healed from what so it's it's really not deciding what it is but making sure that you carry with you that open question and then I, I hear you echoing the words we heard earlier uh, different and equal one does not dominate the other yeah yeah, we get that? yeah we should get that thank you okay here i have to share Ah, well, there's some powerful, it's from the ancient days of Scotland. So, uh, so we probably should, should start moving toward, uh, I was going to talk about decolonizing counseling, but I think you guys have really, have really hit on that because, you know, um, part of it is really decolonizing counseling from what I, I got from you guys respect, you know, and the respect of indigenous knowledge, and not the subservience of indigenous knowledge to psychiatry, to biomedicine, and also the emphasis on relationship, you know, and, and it seems to me that relationship is everything, connectedness is everything. You know that all healing comes, you know, from that. And so before we stop, I wanted to invite you to reflect a bit. Uh, many of our counselors who are listening work with people who are addicted. And um, last week we had some wonderful teachings from Eduardo Duran about respecting the spirit substance. You know, and 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 that, that whatever medicine we take, uh, we take in its spirit. And, and some ideas like that. And I wondered if there's anything that you guys, both of you, uh, would share with our counselors who are working with people who are struggling with addictions. Um, moving them toward um, indigenous ways of, of managing or indigenous ways of approaching addictions. And I know you're going to both fight over who speaks first. <laughs> well, um, because I'm, uh, I know that it's a hopeless situation, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, but I... <laughs> Um, and I wish that I could have um, heard the uh, the talk with Eduardo Lewis, and um, I'm hoping to actually look it up on on the the website if I can. But I also just want to acknowledge the the really important territory that all of the listen, all of your listeners, all of our listeners are are working in. Now, working with Indigenous people, whether it be with people who are struggling with substances or struggling with other problems or difficulties in their life. It's incredibly important work and especially to be able to provide an indigenous perspective and to be able to access indigenous knowledge and to be able to just, uh, I guess, touch on the, the people that you're working with, with their indigenous um, perspectives. And so I just, in relation to your question about addictions, um, when we met with George, who I was talking about before, the young person with the 
uh, with that seizure-like episodes and with the voice he was experiencing, Whitmer referred to one of his views about what happened for George, that it related to a an unresolved a conflict that had come down the generations from a great aunt of his. But there was another thing that had, that had happened, which is that he'd started smoking marijuana about six months before. So there was an addiction aspect to this. And Whitmer had a lovely way of describing to this young person why it hadn't why it wasn't a good idea for him to carry on smoking marijuana. And so, Whitamu, I'm wondering if you can explain what you said to George. I think basically what I said is, and I say it to a lot of people I work with, especially, um, there's, a, there's a text that talks about alienation in the mind, it pushes you away from reality or what's real. Um, and sometimes it could be by some deficiency and, and chemical or, or a knock on the head. And it's often said sometimes by evil works, which is sexual abuse, physical and mental abuse. And often in our culture, by the sins of the forefathers visiting the of generations below, and because it hasn't been resolved, it becomes a curse that follows you down the generations. So what happened is that I talked to them about anything that, any substance that alters the mind opens a doorway to the, to the spiritual realm. And anything from that side of, you know, we have the earthly realm, there's the spiritual realm. Anything from the spiritual realm, with the generations that have passed, good or bad, can come back through that doorway. Come back with voices, telling you what to do, how to do it, whether you should hurt yourself, voices just pouring through. Um, and often you can't distinguish between what's real and what's not, or there's so many noises you can't select. Like we can probably hear three different things going on around us, and they will think that's my wife speaking, that's the kettle boiling, that's a car going past. Whereas with the door being open, jammed open by a mind altering substance, it's just, you can't tell the difference. Anyway, so I asked them, I said to them, you have to stop because you're a gifted young man. You have to stop doing what you're doing in order for you to be able to close the door which means you only open it to the things that you select. So, he stopped smoking dope. And what I noticed, and I noticed that every time Widomo and I had met with a young person, I could tell lots of young people that it's not a good idea to smoke marijuana um, from the point of view, uh, especially if they have a spiritual gift, which Widomo was referring to. Um, but it's, it's been much more powerful for Whitamu to, to explain that to them. I've noticed that's much more influential than me as a psychiatrist telling someone to um, stop smoking cannabis. Um, and yeah, but, and especially that explanation about opening up the spiritual doorway, um, and then they've got much less control about what, um, uh, difficult material from the other side is coming through. Uh, this has been quite, it seems like it's been quite a powerful explanation for young people and they've often taken notice of that. Um, and I guess in relation to that, the, the issue of young people and adults and children recognizing when they do have spiritual awareness and the need to look after that and Wittemu, I'm wondering if you can just talk about that because I actually think there are a lot of young, a lot of young people and adults who become caught up with substance use because actually they've got some spiritual awareness and they just don't know how to manage that or deal with that. Um, and that's kind of a bit of your specialty area, Wittemu. Would you comment on that? I, I, I think that is the fact that 
we try and block a lot of things out that we that are harassing us or creating um, some distress or difficulty for us. And we tend to think that we can block it out by taking something else to give us a good feeling, to give us a high feeling, and it has the reverse effect. It's like somebody who has just broken a relationship, who goes out and gets on the booze, who goes out and drinks and drinks, trying to, uh, to, to quell that breaking heart, whereas in fact, we know that alcohol and that is actually, um, it, it makes you worse. You know, it, it, it makes you worse. So it's the same when they think that they're trying to block out voices or block out trauma that has happened in their lives by altering the mind, where in fact it's opening another doorway up where voices can fall through saying, actually, you should kill yourself. You're not good to anybody. You know, you're worthless. Um, you're no good. Kill yourself. So they don't realize that by by opening up that doorway, these things, then they really are there. These yucky things can come through and tell them how to, and influence them to hurt themselves. And Wadamu, would you just mind um, uh, commenting on Matakiti and, and just explaining that from your point of view? Okay. Matakiti is, uh, is the ability to see the unseen or to have knowledge of something that is taking place with the person, whoever is having difficulty or is in distress. So the word matikiti, if you break that word up, I love breaking words up, pulling them apart and analyzing these words, but matikiti, ma by te the kiti means to see. By the seeing, one would have knowledge. By that knowledge, one would find a way. So it's saying that the unseen, if you can get knowledge of the unseen, the things that are happening around a person that they haven't told you, and in a lot of cases able to say, well, have you been to the doctor for that spot on your, on your lung? Or... There's something wrong with the kidney on the left hand side. Straight away, that's going to build a faith in a person that, wow, there really is a thing like spirituality. There really is a doorway that, that I need to shut. So, that is actually a, a, a tool or a gimmick that can be used to insist or to encourage young people to stop doing what they're doing that's not good for them, especially with the mind. Is that enough? Good. <laughs> and, and also that, that concept also, um, Wittemu often uses it to refer to the spiritual gifts that young people have. Um, now, Lewis, I'm wondering how we're going for time and, and where are we up to? Well, I think I think we're probably coming to the end because we probably have more than we can actually show. So I think we're ready to close. But I I'd like to offer both of you guys uh, a chance to summarize or to say anything that you forgot that you. Um, or just or anything that anything any closing remarks from both of you so you have to go first Alistair, because you always make me go first. thanks Lewis look for me this has been a privilege and an honor um, and I uh, I've really enjoyed um, being part of this conversation and seeing you both, Lewis and Barbara, but also thinking about the audience. And I, I guess what I would like to say to the audience is that it, 
it matters so much having Indigenous councillors. Um, and I noticed this because I work in an Indigenous service and it makes a huge difference for the, for the young people and families that we work with to have um, Indigenous counsellors, therapists, psychologists, social workers to work with um, because they, they have a sense that their situation can be understood in a way that it's not, it's not the same when they meet with someone like me even um, just because I, I come from a different worldview um, and including with my medical training and, and people want to be able to benefit from that and I think that's important, but it's not the same as working with an Indigenous practitioner. And so I just want to really acknowledge the work that you're all doing um, and just grateful to have this opportunity to share. For me, it's always a pleasure to share the work um, that you know, what Amu does and the privilege I've had to work alongside him sometimes. Yeah, so it feels a bit like a real privilege. I just want to thank you, Lewis, for this opportunity and Barbara as well. I have a quick question, which is, is just, it, it, have you ever had, have you ever really disagreed with each other and, and what happens when you do? <laughs> do you want to go first, what am I? Yeah, let's have Wilma go first. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Wilma. Yes, we have had a disagreement. Heaps of disagreements. The disagreements are that I don't want to go first when we're talking. <laughs> or presenting. Um, I disagree that there is a need to have me around when we have these conferences. Um, I think, I think for me, is that the Tatai Hono part is that when you give trust, it's to the death. This is what I'm saying. Tatai Hono means to the death. It's so. I keep telling this fellow over here, you can do it. You know just as much as I do about um, cultural stuff now. Um, and he still doesn't want to do it. And I respect that. But I will always argue about it. But I respect it. That's probably the only disagreement that we've ever had. I don't know. And there are things that he's wanted me to do or talk about that I've disagreed with. But those are only little minor things. So, back to you, Alistair. Thanks for that lovely question, Barbara. Um, I think that there are many things that we might have disagreed on. Certainly, I've been sceptical of all kinds of things that Wadamu has said. Um, <laughs> often, I've been shocked by things that he's come up with, even in, this, in a session with a family. Um, and usually what he's done is he said, that's all right. Um, go, could you go and check this out with the family in three months' time? And so in six months' time, when I finally got a message from the family, I discovered that what he said in the first place was spot on, and I, it totally threw me out. And so he, But he's got me to follow up on the things that I was totally puzzled and confused by. Um, and, you know, but the thing, the thing about working together as a psychiatrist, I can be a psychiatrist. And Wadamu can be himself as a Māori healer. And we don't have to agree on everything. We can hold our own perspectives. And provided we've got mutual respect, we can work together. And I can say, well, I don't see it from that point of view, but I respect the fact that you do. And I think this is going to be more important for the family that they hear from Wadamu. Whereas from my point of view as a psychiatrist, this is what I might recommend. Um, but we can have different points of view, and that's fine. That's okay, okay. <laughs> I think we probably have to call it a, an evening yeah. or a morning where you guys are. So uh, I just want to thank you so much. I know that the words that you've spoken 
inspirational for so many of the of the counselors taking the course, and it's certainly inspirational for me. And being uh, around parents, hoping New Zealand will be open the first week of March. I'll see you guys in your own hometown. Thank you so much for offering this tonight. Yes. 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 How do you say, see you later in um, Maori? I'm wondering, Lois, are you okay to finish with a prayer? Yes, yes. And since I opened with the prayer, um, could I invite you guys to finish with the prayer? What am I? Am I unmute? Am I unmuted? Yes, yes, you're unmuted. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd just like to say it's been a privilege and an honor to be here with you guys again. Um, and to the audience, I just wanted to leave this one little thing. Is that because we go and learn all these different um, scientific stuff, we've got a saying that my wife and I use and we say, the finger that points to the moon is not the moon. So all the knowledge I've got about where the moon is, is it still doesn't mean that I'm the moon. What, I, what we try and do is connect people to knowledge of where that moon is. And so as counselors, as workers, the people who come into our space should be valued straight off as being sacred and who carry generations of their people wisdom into that session. And so we should respect them accordingly. Sorry, I've taken that time up. I, I now will do a prayer to finish. I just wanted to leave that for all you awesome counselors out there who are waiting in the wings that work with people. Um, e pāte matua tuauri, that means Father who is the ancient one, the divine spirit, we just ask that you put your protection around this whole meeting, this whole session. Um, and please put your arms around Lewis and Barbara and um, Dakota and keep them safe and let them do the most awesome work they can do. And, the, and with Alistair too, who I well, should see at the end of this week. E pā te matua tua uri ko tukuna atu ki a koe nga nawe nga tangi tukuna mai ki a mātai to aroha o manaki tanga mua ki tone. Um, we just give this all to you, Lord, knowing that, or Father, knowing that you have, we have your ears, that we can send our cries, our wishes, our hopes, our dreams, and you would have them answered if we just persist. Amen. Um, and bless you guys. Um, and the word in Māori for we'll see you again is ka kite anu. Now I'll let you sign. Ka kite anu. In Lakota, it's Doksha Ake. All right, well, thank you guys. Ake, Yeah. Thank you so much. And I uh, love you very much. And thank you for the wonderful prayers. And may we see you in the flesh before too long. Soon. 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 Indeed. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to. I'm going to. Okay, so it's getting near the end. It's almost in the video. But there's a little time for closing discussion if anybody has anything they wish to say. The, the chat will be um, available to review. It is uh, really rich and, and um, yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it, the class is over, Barb. Okay. <laughs>
Any thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lewis and Barbara, how are you? Steve here yeah. from New Zealand as well. Uh, I just like to say I noticed a lot of comments uh, talking about indigenous, and you know sometimes I think uh, we actually are all indigenous to the planet, and we're kind of lucky in a lot of ways that there, we have that connection with a I'm being part Maori or you know with your Native American or whatever. We still have that connection, uh, Wairua, uh, wa sorry Maori that we're talking about, right? And it's unfortunate that um, from a colonization perspective, we have all a lot of Western people who have lost their identity in a lot of ways to their uh, Maori or their, you know, their connection to their uh, indigenous um, upbringing, whether they're Scottish or English or Irish or, you know, whatever country they're from. And, and in some ways, because of that, it can be more challenging for them to understand that connection to be healed in the way that we're speaking now. And, and I wonder, uh, you know, what, what in the future, looking at these types of concepts that we're going through, how, how can they be brought further into helping uh, those that have been colonized but not as connected to their indigenous roots, uh, what, what can be done for them, you know, maybe in another way? Yeah, you know, one of one of our Coyote Institute missions is to bring the wisdom of indigenous cultures into the mainstream. And that is one of the wisdoms, is that mm. we are all indigenous from somewhere. And that we all have these ancestral roots from somewhere. Mm. And, and we can go back and get them and reconnect with them and reclaim them. You know, I think I was so impressed when I went to Hungary and... Um, I learned about Yotangri, which is the indigenous wisdom of Hungary. And, and it's ancient, and it's been kept alive by farmers in the countryside. And, um, and they even did things like sweat lodges. I mean, it was just amazing. I'm like, wow, you guys are like really into this stuff. <laughs> and they're like, Yotangri, you know. And, and the only books about it are in Hungarian and German, you know, translated into German, which one of our, our colleagues gave us the, a German version, which we read very slowly. So, <laughs> but, but, you know, there it was, or um, the steppes of, of Eurasia, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the fabulous Amazonian warriors who kicked Greek butt in 630 BC, you know, um, it's, you know, yeah, there it is, mm -hmm. waiting to be reconnected. Yeah, and I think that's what I like about the connection between Justin coming from that sort of Western uh, style of, of education and learning as a psychiatrist, to actually have that openness, you know, to accept the, the indigenous perspective and, and the the holistic nature of what, what that can provide and in, in determining what, what the actual cause, you know, which isn't looked at as so much uh, from, a, from a Western, as, as a lot of us know. And it's that, like it's digging for the treasure in a lot of ways, you know, and, and like someone mentioned earlier, you know, is the boy that they talked about, um, even though it was perceived to be, you know, quite a, a bad thing that happened to him, but in some ways, was that the gift of him picking that up that he learned from that to then be able to share later with, with, with you know, his relations um, or relationships to things, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm. Well, I hope, I wish everybody uh, dreams of their ancestors mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. And there'll be more discussion online on yes. the Google Classroom. Yes. We will yeah, all enjoy we'll further discussions and I will put up the chat tomorrow for everyone to read and also the video. So thank you everyone. It's been wonderful sharing space with you from all over the planet. It's so cool yeah. to be connected all over the planet. And if you have any questions or concerns, uh, please get in touch. We'll help you figure it all out. So, Or not. <laughs>
Okay. Right. Okay. Bye. Paka paka.